three, two, one, now. A technological masterpiece. Concord turned heads throughout her magnificent career. It was this amazing triumph. I mean, it was a triumph. She flew on the edge of space at twice the speed of sound, outrunning even military jets. Then the back boiler went on and... Yeah! Inside her luxurious cabin, passengers savoured haute cuisine and vintage champagne. It was an opportunity to step into another world. I looked around and there was Ronnie Wood there. He went, hello. <laughs> Behind the glamour, Concord's journey was one of intrigue, backstabbing and catastrophe. The world's most prestigious aircraft crashes. It was an accident that should never, ever have happened. This is the story of an aeroplane that went beyond pure mechanics to become a dream in the sky. It's undeniable that it is the most glamorous and the most exciting and the most brilliant aircraft in the world. This is the story of an aeroplane, an aeroplane that doesn't exist. If it flies, well, flying in it will be like putting Granny in a missile, just seven years from now. In November 1962, two nations, France and Britain, came together with a plan, one that would set their course for the next 40 years. They wanted to build a supersonic airliner, a dream held since the end of the Second World War. If the gamble comes off, it could win a billion dollar market. If it fails, we'll be left with a great big white elephant with its feet stuck firmly on both sides of the English Channel. The very first discussions about Concorde took place in the late 1940s. That's amongst British engineers. They were dreaming of a future that was far, far, far from the world that they actually lived in, which was a world of a bankrupt Britain, of a coal-driven Britain, ration books, a sort of black and white, sooty world. And yet here are these men dreaming up this glorious Dan Dare world. When the Americans succeeded in flying faster than the speed of sound in 1947, a worldwide race began to build the first supersonic passenger plane. The Nazis had made significant strides in aircraft technology during World War II. Now British scientists seized those ideas and took them forward. In the course of our work, this, this sort of shape was evolved as the most likely shape for an aeroplane doing about Mach 2, flying at twice the speed of sound across the Atlantic. It's rather a lovely shape. You really feel if God meant aeroplanes to fly, he meant them to be this shape. Britain now had the makings of a supersonic airliner, but it was going to cost 100 million pounds to realize. Across the channel, France was making progress on an idea that looked suspiciously similar. They unveiled a model of a super caravel, a supersonic caravel, apparently the first supersonic airliner in the world. Rather than compete, the two countries agreed they would combine their designs and share the costs. At Lancaster House, the aviation minister, Mr. Julian Amory, in company with the French ambassador, almost crooned in admiration over the brainchild of their two countries. On behalf of their governments, they signed the agreement for the joint development and production, a foretaste, perhaps, of common market cooperation. They agreed to build one in Toulouse, France, and the other at Filton in Bristol. Once it had that political backing, that political clearance, the funds were there, or so it seemed, but it shouldn't take long to get into the sky. Five years and it would be off. This was a treaty between two centuries-old rivals, so suspicions were high. 
our politicians, I think this is the way it went, didn't trust the French politicians. And so they insisted that if ever anybody went out, then the other side would have to pay the total until it was fully developed. So that meant that we couldn't pull out either. This clause would dog British politicians for the next 10 years. For now, it was time to dig out those phrase books as engineers in Britain and France began work. Monsieur Frappesh, how often do you go to Bristol? Uh, I go to Bristol every two weeks, and I stay for three days. That depends on the work. Of course, we had the language problem. A lot of the French spoke some form of English, whereas very few of the English spoke any French. Do you speak French? Uh, very little, just enough to get by for food and such like. Ceci est un rectangle Both sides of the operation organized language classes for their workers. Alors, où est-ce qu'il travaille en ce moment, Monsieur McDonald? Il travaille uh, dans les ateliers. Dans les ateliers, n'est-ce pas? Dans les ateliers. The French part of the aircraft drawings were in French and we all learned what a drill was or what a belt was or uh, nuts or split pins. We, we kind of got used to the French terms. France's Concorde workers take their lunchtime break. And here at the Sud Aviation Works at Toulouse, it's very different indeed from the British Aircraft Corporation's canteen at Filter. There's about a thousand people in here, and as you can tell, there's a good lot of din. Uh, and most French workmen like to take a glass of wine with their lunch. The British engineer had to be careful, but a lunchtime tipple didn't jeopardize delicate negotiations. The technique was quite good because they would stone all all morning, then give you a good lunch. And then they'd expect you to accept their proposal in the afternoon, uh, which uh, didn't work all the time. Well, yeah, I think it seldom worked. Might have done with the production people. I never found out from them, but that, that's scurrilous, I suppose, yeah. Teams of engineers from France and Britain got on very well together. They liked a bit of uh, raillery, and as they liked pushing each other, the French teased the British, the British teased the French. So that competition amongst the engineers um, and the national prides involved led to a very successful machine. Unlike their engineers, the politicians did fall out. Harold Wilson was furious with President de Gaulle for adding a letter E to the word Concorde so he removed it. But de Gaulle put it back. In Bristol and Toulouse, the workers didn't give a flying fig. Why is it a material? Well, some say Concord, some say Concordy, so I don't think it makes any difference at all. I don't care what they call it, as long as it's uh, successful. So long as it's got the craftsmanship in it and the ability of the men that's working on it to fly. You know, I think myself, we may as well be together and uh, put an E on and make the damn thing and get on with it. But they can put ten E's on it if they wish. I think it was um, Tony Benn that um, said, look, let's put the E on Concord and let's not worry about the little things. And I thought the E actually did, uh, did the aircraft a favour. It, um, um, it was just a nice little touch. People were working together for the betterment of uh, the aircraft industry. A year on from the Anglo-French Treaty, the first designs of Concorde were released. A wooden mock-up demonstrated the interior and the high-tech heat shield. The orders came in very early. The aviation industry was very excited. Remember, supersonic flight was in its early uh, days, but it was thrilling. I think it thrilled everyone. It thrilled airline executives, hard to imagine today. Uh, airline executives being thrilled by the poetry of flight, but they were then. Concorde was the way forward. Everyone knew that. Airlines across the world responded with great excitement. 16 airlines ordering some 75 aircraft. Many of the orders were by airlines in the US, which infuriated President John F. Kennedy. So he announced a plane that would be bigger faster and travel even further than Concorde. And we are talking about a plane in the end of the 60s that will move ahead at a speed faster than Mach 2 to all corners of the globe. America simply wasn't going to be left behind. They were worried already because there's another player involved, 
the Soviets, who also had supersonic technology developing a pace, also had um, former Nazi German engineers and designers working on aircraft and other military machinery. Um, so if, naturally the Americans were worried. Now that it had customers, Concorde had to be turned into a reality. Everything was built from scratch, stretching existing materials to the limit. It's the biggest international project, air project ever undertaken. I mean, after the American space program and the Russian space program, this is probably the biggest of its kind in the world. What made it even bigger was that they were building two identical planes. So every part had to be manufactured twice, one for the French prototype and one for the British. Duplicate sets of drawings, you've got duplicate sets of management, duplicate sets of engineers. Boy, the fact it worked was wonderful, but the costs were racking up all the time. The Concorde's basic design features have been established and its performance defined. Cruising speed of Mach 2.2 or 1,450 miles an hour. To be able to fly at more than twice the speed of sound required huge leaps in aircraft design. The wings were perfected through months of exhaustive wind tunnel testing. The engines, taken from a military aircraft, were completely rebuilt, making them more than twice as powerful. We changed almost everything in that engine. And even the fuel system was changed by the time we'd finished. The long streamlined nose was designed to cut through the air faster than any other passenger aircraft. But engineers had to come up with an ingenious solution for takeoff and landing. People are always fascinated by the droop snoot, but I mean, the reality is that it, it was actually really very much necessary. And the whole object of the exercise of the droop snoot was to get that long needle nose out of the pilot's line of sight so that he could see the runway in front of him. By 1966, large sections of the aircraft were being shipped from factories on either side of the channel. Then, bang on time, the first French-built component for the second prototype reached Filton. The vehicle and its load had travelled direct from Toulouse by road and cross-channel car ferry. This is the normal method for moving Concorde components between Toulouse and Filton. I remember the very first sections of the aircraft being delivered from the various production sites, and the nose section was one of the first. Security in those days was not as you would expect nowadays. Uh, with such a sensitive project. So I would spend a lot of time during the day coming down with just a little clipboard with something scribbled on. I was down here every day just about looking round and I'm sure my bosses used to think, where's Nigel? But I was, oh yeah, be downstairs with his clipboard. It was a passion and a pride and privilege to be actually working out here and see this aircraft which was being built from scratch to something which would become the, an icon of the 20th century. Visiting the British Aircraft Corporation factory at Filton near Bristol, the Queen was to see for herself how the Anglo-French Concorde project was shaping, to the delight of the crowd. But it was during her tour the news came that increased costs for developing the 1,500 mile an hour jetliner had rocketed to an estimated 500 million pounds. Now, while Her Majesty was showing keen interest in the work, Parliament was expressing concern at the project's soaring expense. Concorde had cost five times its original budget. To make matters worse, the airlines who'd ordered it were asking for expensive additions. It was impossible really for Concorde not to go over budget because the original idea was that Concorde would be this lightweight supersonic dart sipping across the Atlantic or around the world. Because it went so fast, well, the VIPs on board wouldn't need much more from an English point of view than a sort of sandwich cup of tea and a glass of whiskey. But when other airlines looked at it, particularly the French, they said, no, this is a luxury aircraft. Its passengers would want champagne, Bordeaux wine and haute cuisine. But all this excess was causing Concorde to put on weight, adding even more to the bill. French never cared about the cost at all. 
It escalated substantially. When we mentioned this to a French minister, he'd hold up his hand. So, but these things are really, when you get to this scale, they're political. They have to be decided politically. And as far as the French were concerned, it was the grandeur of France. As far as the Treasury was concerned, it was, can you make a quick buck for tax cuts for the rich? I mean, that was the difference between the British and French attitude. But I'm proud of the fact that I stopped it being cancelled because the Treasury wanted to cancel it and the Cabinet wanted to cancel it. The future of Concord will be decided by Concord in the course of this year. They couldn't do this because one, the French were committed to it, and if the British had truly pulled out, had done a kind of, you know, Concord Brexit, what would have happened then is the French would have sued the British. It's an extraordinary thought, isn't it? But you, country can sue another country. Britain would have had to pay a fortune to France. None of this seemed to matter. On a glorious winter's day in 1967, when Concord 001 was unveiled in France. And the guests watch as the great hangar doors open to reveal 001, the first Concorde prototype. The atmosphere was one of wild optimism and excitement for the future, where even the flight attendants were dressed for space travel. All this, and the plane hadn't even left the ground yet. And here, a touch of symbolism. The two ministers jointly cut the ribbons to release the aircraft for its ceremonial rollout. Here too was a chance to meet the brave test pilots who would risk their lives flying the prototypes. For the French, former Air Force Major André Turcar. And holding up the British end of things, Brian Trubshaw, a former World War II bomber pilot. Awkward, camera shy, but practical. You don't worry very much about the danger. No, I, I don't think you can. Uh be a person who worries very much about the danger, if that danger is really there anyway. You've got to have some fear, otherwise you, you'll just go at the thing like a bull-headed animal, and I think some degree of fear is a, it's a fundamentally required quality in the test pilot. I first met Brian Chubshaw in 1968, and he actually had an office next door to the department where I worked. We had to dress them sometimes in some of the gear, because initially on Concorde, they had to wear parachutes, pressure suits, as if they were flying a fighter plane. It's very hot. When you're a test pilot and you're going to fly an airplane, which is a known, known force, there's a lot to think of. And you don't want people fussing around. You just want to get on with it. And there are a lot of people trying to make a fuss. Trubshaw hated press scrutiny. He was used to being in control. Yeah. Okay. Who's going to make the final decision as to when you do actually take off? I do. And nobody else. Trubshaw might be in charge of the British end, but the French Concorde would be flying first. He'd be reduced to watching from the sidelines when on March the 2nd, 1969, André Turcar took Concorde 001 on its maiden flight. The main thought is, will everything keep going? Well, that was me. That was the kind of thinking I did. Uh, other people shut their eyes, I think, when, <laughs> in case it went wrong. I certainly watched the maiden flight out of Toulouse, and I think Raymond Baxter's commentary still makes all the hairs on the back of my neck stand on end. It was a brilliant piece of commentating by him. 135. Rotate any second. Nose wheel well up. Smooth rotation continuing. Nose come up to 20 degrees. She's airborne. She flies. Concord flies at last. As Monsieur Turcard goes off to face the hazards of a press conference, the flight at Toulouse was a great success. But Trubshaw wasn't happy with the media circus and was now threatening to ban everyone from the British attempt. This performance, which surrounds this first flight of 001, is uh, wrong. I don't agree with it. And I realize that in saying that to you, I'm stating it publicly. But I am absolutely opposed to this. 
And it is possible that I shall refuse to allow a similar activity for 002. As the big day drew near, it was clear that this would be a huge public event. The whole length of the field was filled with people, employees. And up on the hills there, there are people watching. Well, I chose to stand down where the aircraft was so I could hear the engine start up. Smoky Joe, as she was called at the time, because they were early production engines, quite smoky and dark smoke out the back. We began to turn around the colleague I was with, so we better move back because we're going to be affected by the jet blast. But I said, no, I'm going to stay here. I don't want to smell the kerosene. I don't want to get blown over. And the noise when she actually got to run away, open the throttles, full power with reheat. It was a magnificent sight. Concorde 002 flew for a whole 22 minutes, touching down at RAF Fairford, 50 miles away. Here the pilots were greeted by an even bigger press corps. It had been a wonderful first flight. Trubshaw's place in history was guaranteed, whether he liked it or not. Concorde now embarked on a rigorous program of flight testing. And for those with the right connections, here at last was a chance to have a go at the controls. Here's key on conservation. What do you think of the level of noise and smoke? I was inside and I wasn't smoking. <laughs> <laughs> Joking aside, Concorde smoky engines were a concern. Even more worrying was the noise created when she flew faster than the speed of sound. Anyone on the ground would hear two very loud bangs, known as the sonic boom. I mean... <laughs> When a supersonic aircraft flies over a town, a suburb, or a city, it will smash loose windows. I mean, it just does. And when tests were made in Britain, boy, the complaints that poured in were legion. By 1972, Concorde was still far from ready to enter service, and the cost of the project had broken a billion pounds. Desperate to add to the 75 planes already ordered, the prototype was sent on a sales tour with a small army of engineers in tow. My role then was to walk beside the aircraft to make sure it got to the taxi point safely and then we would start the engines and um, help it on its way. We did all the maintenance uh, that we could, helping the inspection with looking at tyre pressures, hydraulic levels, lots of stuff like that. Trying to sell the plane on behalf of the government was the suave new Minister for Aerospace, Michael Heseltine. One of the first stops was Iran, where the Shah, a keen pilot, seemed a likely customer. It was designed to be the peak of the first sales trip, uh, and hopefully I would secure his agreement to buy it. Well, it all went reasonably to plan. Um, well. Not quite. We went on board and he came and sat alongside me and I had 45 minutes flights in which to persuade him to buy and to allow us over flying rights. Plane took off, he got up, said I must go on the flight deck. That's the last I saw of him until we had landed. Back on the tarmac, the Shah casually agreed to the deal, but without a witness, it was far from binding. And then to my huge relief, somebody said, 
Your Majesty, the Times, London. Are you going to buy it? Yes, he said. Two. Your Majesty, the Times, again, if you will. Will you give us over flying rights? Yes, will. My job is done. Tehran had gone well, but now the sales tour backfired. Rather than winning new orders, they began to lose them. The black smoke produced by the prototype engines horrified the Japanese. They cancelled their order for three aircraft. Things continued to go badly down under. En route from Darwin, 002 has made Concorde's first sustained supersonic flight over land. When Concorde visited Australia, people were very concerned about the noise disturbing Aboriginal homelands. There was a sense of this aviation colonialism that the British and French were using this machine to overfly poorer peoples who would never be able to fly on Concorde themselves. The sonic boom was becoming a global issue. For example, they were banned from flying down the seaboard of India because the Indians were saying, well, why should we be disturbed by this noise? Are we less important than British and French people? Concorde was heading home, having had its first taste of a turbulent future. But for those lucky enough to be on board, it was an experience to remember, particularly the last leg into Toulouse. That was the longest supersonic flight it had done. We walked the whole length of the Mediterranean. We could see Africa on the left-hand side and Europe on the right-hand side as we flew at 58,000 feet. The three of us that flew on the aircraft just couldn't stop talking about it, you know. <laughs> it was amazing. On its return home, Concorde was given the royal seal of approval. But the truth was, its future was far from certain. Across the pond, America's project was struggling even to get off the ground. When Boeing first showed its supersonic airline, it showed it in the form of a gigantic life-size model. Good afternoon, gentlemen. The Boeing Company takes great pride in presenting to you the United States supersonic transport. The Boeing design was too complex. They had a swing wing and they had a double droop snoot. The nose bent in two places, not just in one. And also the Americans were facing much greater economic challenges. They were running the Apollo program and also they were embroiled in the Vietnam War, which was sucking up huge amounts of money. Having spent a billion dollars with little to show, the US government pulled the plug. The Russians appeared to be faring better. Their plane, nicknamed Konkordsky, was poised to enter service. I was very struck by the uh, similarities of the design to the Concorde, which leads me to believe there was certainly industrial espionage going on. Having said that, I suspect the industrial espionage worked both ways. The Russian project was actually quite brilliant in one way, in that Konkordsky was the first supersonic airliner to fly. The thing worked, it flew. Terrific, what a wonderful public relations coup for the Soviet Union. There was one little problem in that the aircraft was rushed. In many ways it was crude compared to Concorde. Its interior, boy, if you think flying on certain modern airlines is unpleasant, you should have tried Concorde's key. Lavatories wouldn't work, lighting would stop. There was no hold for luggage under the aircraft. The seats were very flimsy, thin things. It had been too rushed. And of course, it proved to be quite self-destructive. In June 1973, on a demonstration flight at the Paris Air Show, Konkordsky suffered a catastrophic failure. She was diving and about to crash. It tore itself to pieces and exploded, and only a rainfall of bits and pieces hit the ground. All six crew and eight people on the ground were killed. Konkordsky would fly just 55 commercial flights inside the Soviet Union before being grounded in 1978. Concorde's superb engineering made failure far less likely. But now, ready to enter service, it had problems of its own. This was a bad time. Remember the early 70s? Gosh, 1973, 74, it's the time of the great oil crisis. Fuel costs rocketed, 
and more than that, it was also the time when the environmental lobby becomes vocal. We dread one flight over our heads. If the French and the British made a mistake with this plane, we're sorry for them. Concorde is no longer the darling of the skies, it's being seen as a dark prince. Poor Concorde, shown at the right time in the optimistic days of the late 60s, and got to the market at exactly the wrong time. By the end of 1973, a year after the world tour, almost every one of Concorde's orders had been cancelled. The dream of selling hundreds of aircraft was sunk. Not even British Airways and Air France were interested. They did, n did not want Concorde in the least. They had no interest in the aeroplane whatsoever. I'm talking about the management of the airline. And they just said, we don't want them, we don't want them. Well, that was humiliating. So I negotiated what, in fact, was a gift on profit-sharing conditions, which meant no cash flow until the thing made a profit. And that was the basis on which I did this humiliating deal. Uh, but at least I got a sale. British Airways had acquired five aircraft worth £22 million each. So there was no holding back when it came to launching their first flights. A huge publicity stunt involving international superstar Shirley Bassey. In 1977, flights to New York began. Anyone able to stump up 431 pounds for a single fare could cross the Atlantic in three and a half hours, rather than eight. And they would discover that from the very first moment of arriving for a Concorde flight, this was a unique and very special experience. The great thing about the Concorde flights was that the Concorde lounge happened very quickly. So having got a ticket, you went through the Concorde doors and you were in a kind of rather nice hotel type reception. It was just like going to a big feast. There was uh, hors d'oeuvres and canopies, everything all laid out. It was just one to drink as much as, you know, whatever, help yourself at the bar. George had a G&T because he's the G&T king. And I had a coffee. We would look at the passenger list, and if we knew they were regulars, we called them by their name. They loved that um, familiarity of coming on and knowing the crew. I mean, most people think, you know, Concorde, that's a great big, huge aeroplane, but when you actually get up close to it, it's, it wasn't that big an aircraft. And especially when you get inside, it's quite, quite narrow inside. The ceiling was low and the windows were tiny. The windows were not like windows on a normal plane. They were little tiny portholes. I'm searching to avoid the word cramped, but that, it was cramped, in fact. You, you, were, you were tight and, and, you, and the seat in front was close and, you know, there was no space. Before takeoff, while we were taxiing up, we would take a bar order, we would try and offer champagne, hot towels would be offered as they are in first class, and we managed to get all that done while the aircraft was taxiing. It was just wonderful, wasn't it, George? It was romantic. Absolutely. It was so romantic. I don't know why I used that word, but it was just fantastic. I felt, I felt like a film star. They made you feel like that. I was quite scared. I think David Frost was on it. And I knew David and I said, um, I'm a bit nervous about this, David. He said, oh, darling, don't be. I do it three times a week. <laughs> the sensation the passengers would be aware of more than anything else would be during the takeoff. Three, two, one, now. The acceleration, you could really feel it. This great sort of surge of acceleration in the small of your back. And you knew that the airplane was accelerating rapidly down the runway. The tray table in front of me fell down. So I was leaning forward trying to get this tray back. I don't know why I was caring about the tray, but 
and I couldn't get forward to, it felt like I was being pushed back in my seat. I think when we took off, we took off about a 30, 30 degree angle. But when he put, pressed the button, put the afterburners on, you practically stood on the tail, but oh, what a flight. And it was, but it was so thrilling. There was a wonderful moment where you just watched London go into a little dot, which was just fantastic. And I was white knuckling it, and then as soon as it took off, it was fantastic. Thanks to the sonic boom controversy, Concorde was only allowed to fly supersonically over the sea. But now the throttle could be opened up. And then the back boiler went on and yeah! And it just went on and on and on. And you could see the, the numbers ticking up on the speed. And it was quite hard to comprehend because there's some point where you think, I'm actually now going faster than a bullet. When the Mac counter registered twice the speed of sound, um, I decided I'm going to the loo. And I went to the loo at Mac 2. I was invited to go into the cockpit and I was quite scared because I had heard so many scary things about Concorde and to me it was a bit like going into space. It was surreal. It was amazing because all you could see was the blue sky and uh, you couldn't really see anything else. And um, it was just as smooth as lying in bed. You had no sensation of speed at all. You were sitting up there at 55, 58,000 feet in this very calm, tranquil atmosphere. You're above the thunderstorms, you're above the jet streams, you're above everything that causes turbulence. You almost felt that you were just hanging there, suspended in space. I never got used to it. I would pinch myself in disbelief. We were doing 23 miles a minute. We're actually flying at uh, twice the speed of sound, and to be precise, 1,341 miles per hour, 11 miles up. And this is how smooth it can be at twice at more than twice the speed of sound. Now at cruising height, the aperitifs and canapes consumed, passengers could start ordering from the menu. But this was not just any food. This was Concorde food. The champagne flowed, the caviar came out, and the smoked salmon. We would start the meal service with a a pre-plated cold hors d'oeuvre. Then there was a choice of three hot main courses and a cold one. When I was flying, the chefs who designed the menus, were, in particular, were the Rue brothers. And in fact, we had them on a flight one day and um, we were very nervous that the way we cooked the food lived up to how they had designed it. And it was silver service. And the menu, I mean, we had lobster and chicken. You know, I don't go buy that go out and buy that very often. And to wash it all down, a wine list worthy of a Michelin-starred restaurant. The guy comes past with the wine and I say, no thanks. And then I look and it's a Fort, Chateau Fort de la Tour, which is like one of the really, really great um, French wines. And I was thinking, I've never had a Fort de la Tour. The wine was excellent, as was the food. I mean, really, really good. I had some more, and I had some more, and I had some more, and by the time I, you know, I'd actually arrived in New York, I had a 10 o'clock meeting, I suddenly realized that I had drunk probably about half a bottle of um, one of the finest clarets on earth. Concord was expensive and prestigious, with an in-flight service aimed at those with class. So there really was only one type of passenger, those who could afford it. Investment bankers, Fund managers were absolutely regular users of the airplane. They used it as a commuting tool. When I'm doing it every week, I truly can just regard it as commuting to work. Speed is what it's all about for me, the ability to avoid these overnight flights, get to the other end fresh. And that's what this uh, great plane does. The next category were your film stars, celebrities, pop musicians, and the whole atmosphere on the airplane was completely different from the atmosphere you'd get on subsonic open. All these guys, they were constantly flying across the Atlantic on Concorde, and they all knew each other, 
and it was a it was a sort of sociable event. This particular time in the 80s, I was doing a lot of traveling. I was working in LA on a series and I um, wanted to come back to London a lot to see my family. So it really made a huge difference in my life being able to go on Concord. It was very expensive, um, but um, sometimes it's worth investing in things that make you happy. But there was another type of passenger, those who had saved up to enjoy the trip of a lifetime. They often got more than they were expecting. I looked round and there was Ronnie Wood there. <laughs> he went, hello. <laughs> I said, did you? Ronnie Wood. Well, as soon as I said that, I'd Another four came down, it was Mick Jagger and all the lot. So he came down and he said hello and he shook our hands and uh, I said, George, I'm not, I've got to go to the door, I won't be a minute. So with that, Mick Jagger got up and he followed me. Anyway, we waited outside and the, a person came out. <laughs> he said, well, go on, Gwen. So I said, no, no, you go first. I didn't like to call him Mick, it seemed a bit... So I said, you go in first. Did you shot? Sure? Yes. So, of course, he, he went in, came out, I went in. Of course, it was still warm. Oh, my word. I was, came over quite unnecessary. No matter how exciting things got, all too soon, the seatbelt sign would light up and Concorde would begin its descent. Very many passengers would get off the airplane feeling really sorry that the flight had ended. You know, couldn't it go on a bit longer? They were enjoying it so much. By the time you'd had a few drinks and uh, something to eat and maybe a tiny snooze, there you were in London, in the rain. Concord has struck a chord with passengers and crew alike, but it was hemorrhaging money. By 1981, after just five years in service, British Airways and Air France had recorded losses in the tens of millions on their Concorde operations. It was too expensive a service to operate and it was just too limited. That was the problem. The only route it could fly successfully was New York, London, London, New York, and a bit of Paris, New York, London, Paris. What Concorde needed was to charge a hell of a lot for tickets and to make it very exclusive indeed. British Airways put up Concorde prices to nearly double those of first class on its other flights. So now, in the mid-1980s, Concorde was at last turning a profit. But with only one successful route, London to New York, most of the fleet was sitting idle. The answer was to allow Concorde to be chartered. Anyone with the money could hire the whole plane and take it wherever they wanted. my friends said they would like to fly in Concorde and they thought that I should organize it for them. So I thought, well, why not? So I rang up and I said, um, could I charter Concorde for my friends, supersonic for an hour and a half? So he said to me, well, you can charter it for 17,500 pounds. So that worked out to um, 175 pounds per passenger. And I filled two Concords, I could easily have done a third the charter market exploded as a host of entrepreneurs, Concorde fan clubs and travel agents cashed in on the new demand. Those charter flights um, took Concorde to over 250 destinations around the world. 76 of those were in the USA. And so that enabled Concorde to be used as an experience, the trip of a lifetime experience for many people, but also a major marketing tool for British Airways. One popular destination was a day trip to Egypt. You could visit the pyramids of Giza in the land of the pharaohs and still be home in time for tea. What did you like best? My dinner on the Concord coming out. <laughs> really? Yes. But I've loved it all, but that was lovely. We're flying now down the Adriatic, and as we approach Egypt, someone from the front said, if those on the left-hand side, if you look out slightly to the front, there's the pyramids and there's the Sphinx. He said, I feel sorry for you, those on the right. He said, oh, sod it, that was his words. He did a figure of eight, so those on the... 
And I thought, lovely. It did Christmas Santa specials. Fly from Bournemouth to the north of Finland to Lapland to meet Father Christmas. It did little tours, jaunts around the Bay of Biscay for very little money indeed. When I had the surprise on my 50th birthday, which is in 1999, they said, um, Dad, we've got your present. We don't really know what to get you, but would this be okay? And I opened the envelope, this envelope here that I got when, with my boarding pass. Absolutely fantastic. The prestigious Concorde experience was at last being enjoyed by the very people whose taxes had paid for it. It didn't matter who you were, you treated them all the same because they were flying this aircraft and they were getting the service that was expected of you. And there were some unique experiences that only Concorde could provide. So the sun had set, but we're flying sort of northwest across towards Italy. And he said, we're going so fast, the sun is coming back up. And what an experience to see the sun coming back up. And as we got to Heathrow, the music stopped and someone started and he had a good voice and he played the Queen and we sang, God Save the Queen. And that was the end of a glorious day. Brilliant. Concord was becoming a national icon and the plane was to be found at the heart of major public events. It seemed like the dream would go on forever. I was retired and I'd been on the bus to the Farnborough. As I got on the bus, uh, somebody said the Concorde has crashed in France. And I told him not to, not to be so bloody silly. It was July the 25th, 2000, and the unthinkable had happened. The world's most prestigious aircraft crashes. More than 100 people are dead. I couldn't believe it because you, you can't, it couldn't crash. It was too magical to crash. Do you know what I mean? It sounds childish, but in your mind, it was just forever. And to think people that died, it, it was just dreadful. According to Air France, of the 100 passengers, two were Danish, one was a US citizen, the rest were German. The crash at Gornes shocked the world. Now every detail of the final moments of Flight 4590 was scrutinised. It was a crash that was a classic aircraft accident. It was a whole series of events, and it was the cumulative effect of each of the errors in this error chain that led to the final overwhelming catastrophe. It was a hot July day in Paris, and the Air France Concorde was on a charter flight, taking a, a hundred passengers to New York to join a cruise ship. It was fully laden. The airplane had been overfueled; all the fuel tanks and the wing had been filled up completely full. Nineteen items of baggage were put in the rear cargo hold, which were never weighed. The net result of all this was that the airplane was over the maximum structural weight. They were running late, so there was a lot of pressure on the crew to taxi out and take off as quickly as possible and to get to New York non-stop. By the time it had got to the runway threshold, it had only burnt 800 kilos of the 2,000 kilos of taxi fuel that he had allowed for. And what he should have done was to have burned off all that taxi fuel before he got airborne. As they went down the runway, the airplane encountered a piece of metal, a piece of metal lying on the runway that had come off a Continental Airlines DZ-10. There was a piece of metal left on the runway, but there were also maintenance errors on the part of Air France. In the left-hand undercarriage, which had been worked on by Air France a couple of days before the crash, they'd failed to put back in there a component called the spacer. Without that spacer, the wheels could wobble around like wheels on a supermarket trolley. The tyre encountered the piece of metal when the aeroplane was travelling at 185 miles an hour as the piece of metal cuts in. But it didn't puncture the tyre in a conventional way. What it did was scalp the tyre. That flew up and hit the underside of the aeroplane with a tremendous amount of energy. It set up a shockwave in that fuel tank. There was no airspace in the fuel tank to absorb the energy of that shockwave. 
it blew out a piece of metal, not a rupture from inside to out, but a mini explosion from inside, and out came 100 litres a second of fuel. A really massive fire generating a lot of smoke and a lot of unburned fuel, which goes into the engines. The fire warning went off for the number two engine, and the flight engineer, without any discussion with the captain or the first officer at all, just went straight into a fire drill and shut that engine down. The pilot rotated the aircraft 15 knots early to try and climb away. It went off to the left-hand side of the runway, hit a runway light before getting airborne. Sadly, staggered into the air. It never remotely reached its in-flight safety speed, which was 220 knots. They tried to climb away, got to about 200 feet, but couldn't climb anymore. But the real damage was done. The real damage was this massive fire. This dreadful blowtorch of fuel, flaming fuel pouring out of tank number five, causing the center of gravity to move further rearwards. And this led to the airplane just rearing up. And once that had happened, really sadly, the airplane and all those on board were doomed. It was an accident that should never, ever have happened. The official French crash report concluded that the piece of metal on the runway had exposed vulnerabilities to Concorde's fuel tanks and tyres. Air France and British Airways grounded their aircraft while expensive safety modifications were made. They were relaunched in November 2001, but the world had moved on. Two months before, the attacks on New York's Twin Towers had claimed 2,700 lives. Air travel lost its appeal, and demand for business flights into New York plummeted. Concorde was crossing the Atlantic almost completely empty. Added to that, maintenance costs were soaring, and so in April 2003, Concorde's retirement was announced. It's the end for Concorde after 30 years of supersonic flying. British Airways and Air France will retire the plane in six months' time. Well, it was a shame, you know, when you heard the story that um, it was going to be taken out of service. That was, what a bad day that was. That was horrible. Nobody, nobody liked that at all. Over the next six months, there was a rush to take a last flight on Concorde. Every seat was sold and more flights were added. Then, a grand tour of the United States, Canada, and the United Kingdom. Finally, on the 24th of October, 2003, Flight 002 left New York for the last time. So, we're uh, just about to set course, and uh, the acceleration on the runway is quite something to remember, as I'm sure will be the rest of the flight. It was done with a lot of press hullabaloo, as you can imagine. It's a big, important day. But on board the aircraft, the top celebrities <laughs> and the big red-faced newspaper editors and TV presenter type people on board spent their time, as far as I could see, getting drunk. There were a lot of celebrities, and among them was Piers Morgan and Jeremy Clarkson, who had a fight and they were throwing glasses of water at each other like great overgrown schoolboys. This machine, if you could have seen it flying through the sky, I mean, staggeringly fast, just a this thing, never lost its beauty, its poise, its composure. And inside, the very last flight, it was, I think, so rough and drunken and awful. First one Concorde, then another, a sight never seen before, three in all waiting to land. As we came down, we saw tons and tons of people all waving and shouting and with flags and banners. And all of the fire engines from Heathrow had their hoses on and they were spraying water all over Concorde as it landed. It was very, very moving because it was like, it was totally the end of an era. It was the end of an era. The end of the reception, about 10.30 at night, I walked out across the tarmac. I was the last to leave. 
and there were five perfectly serviceable Concords sitting on the ramp and they would never carry fare paying passengers again and that's the time when it really hit me and that's the time when there was a actually literally a tear in the eye. The end of Concord felt to many as though the supersonic dream was over. Very sad that Concord was retired in 2003 with no obvious successor. It was the first time in aeronautical or perhaps technological history that we'd actually taken a step backwards and we'd just gone back to subsonic aircraft. But in the last few years, a new race has begun with at least three aircraft in development. There's a company working on a 30 to 40 seat supersonic transport for businessmen. I think that could appear on the scene within the next five years. As far as a full-blooded supersonic airliner is concerned, I think we probably are going to have to wait a lot longer for that. And I think eventually we will see perhaps hypersonic suborbital vehicles that do London to Sydney in a matter of three hours, something of that sort, two and a half hours. A month after the final flights into Heathrow, the last Concorde ever made returned to Bristol's Fulton Airfield from where Brian Trubshaw flew in 1969. Concorde was coming home. And of course we cried when we saw the Concorde, the last flight over the suspension. We're up again, emotional now. I loved it. Sadness because you knew it was going to be the last time, yeah. I don't know quite what it is. There's something mysterious about Concord. Most extraordinary, exceptional. The whole country, in fact, probably the whole world, mourned its loss. It changed many people's lives forever, I think. Our whole experience with Concord flying and the demise of Concord has been with us all the time, really, and it's a tragedy. But weren't we lucky to have the opportunity to go on it? Now the star of a new collection dedicated to flight, 50 years after she was unveiled, Concorde is a museum piece. Within 17A. Designed for the elite. This is what it was. I think I bumped my head last time. Paid for by everyone. Oh, it's 17 years and back to the same seat. On the same aircraft. Beautiful, fast, noisy, expensive. Oh, here's the infamous toilet. Many memories of that one. A symbol of post-war hope for the future. Yeah, I, my seat was always, um, I always used to be in the engineer's seat doing engine runs and things, but uh, it's nice to sit up here. Yeah, reverse, the, uh, it was reverse thrust, reheat, and green for go, wasn't green it? Green for go, yeah. Concord lived a life of superlatives and contradictions. The white elephant that became a swan but just a little too far ahead of her time. Absolutely glorious. I think this aircraft used to take people 58, 60,000 feet, sipping champagne, many other people at that, that height and speed. Fighter pilots. We were just so ahead of the time, weren't we? There was nothing like this around. Gets your memory back going. In awe, I'm in awe. Even now, I'm in awe of it. Mm. There'll never be another one like it. It's a shame. It's a wonderful sight. Never thought I'd see it again. Let me take you on a little trip. My supersonic ships at your disposal if you feel so inclined. For more on this awe inspiring supersonic ship, head to BBC iPlayer for an episode of Perpetual Motion from 1994, with contributions from the engineers and crews working on Concorde at the time. In a moment here on BBC4, getting right into the nuts and bolts of a behemoth of the air. Witness a jumbo jet strip down next.